Thank you very much, Rosie. Thank you very much, and it's, um, it, it's, it's terrific to be here. Um, I was feeling intimidated enough and then uh, heard the roll call of people who are coming in a few weeks' time. My goodness, what a, what a gang that is. Um, as Ro Rosie said, I started out at the Times, and it must have been in my first year there editing the paper we were at party political conference and um, Gordon Brown was still prime minister and one of the jobs of the editor is to try and work out what the paper's leader line is on any story, but obviously, importantly, on the politics of the day. And I remember we held a leader conference after Gordon Brown had spoken, after the prime minister of the day had spoken at his party political conference. And a leader conference is a gang of people, the political editor, some of the leader writers, a few of the columnists. And I remember asking the room, well, what did we think this was about? You know, we knew that it was an argument for jobs, it was an argument for a more balanced economy, but, but what, what was it really about? What was it actually about? And I remember there was a pause, and then one of my colleagues said he thought it was about an hour. And as I was coming here this evening, I thought to myself, well, the one thing I know that I'm going to be about is 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to be about 15 minutes, but actually I'm going to try to be about time. And I woke up this morning thinking I will perfect my Olivia Coleman raspberry in the event that I run out of that time, but I'll try and respect the rules of, uh, of 5 by 15. Um, I went to a dinner once and I was sitting opposite Steve Jobs. I know this sounds like the beginning of a great joke. It's not, actually. But I was at a dinner, and I found myself sitting across from Steve Jobs, and I was unbelievably excited. I remember thinking to myself, this is, this is it. This is one of those moments in your life you'll never forget. And I was limbering up to ask a fiendishly insightful and thoughtful question when the person next to me asked a question instead. And they said, Mr. Jobs, how come Pixar is such a great success? And I remember thinking, oh, good grief. We've got him here, right here, and you've asked this unbelievably patsy, pointless question. And the answer that followed was one of those things that has informed, in different ways, the last 10 years of my life and made me think very differently about the news. Because Steve Jobs said, look, when I started out making movies, he said, I didn't really know anything about the film business. So I flew down to Los Angeles to go and see a friend of mine. And I asked them, how do you make films? And the person said to me, basically, the film business is really simple. The only thing that matters is the story. You've got to get the story right. If you get the story right, everything is fine. If you don't, you can forget about it. And so he said he flew back up uh, to San Francisco, worked on Pixar, and he said from then on, every time they made a movie, sure enough, they ended up having a problem with the story. And every time they had a problem with the story, they would stop. They would tell everyone working on the film go home, we'll keep paying you, but go home, and they would spend time fixing the story. Sometimes they would spend six weeks, sometimes eight weeks, sometimes three months. And as he put it, it would often cost 20, 30 million dollars to fix the story, but then everybody would come back, they would finish the animation of the movie, and as we all know, each film became a billion dollar franchise. And I've thought about that a lot. I've thought about that a lot because we can talk a great deal about journalism and news. But in the end, the only thing that matters is the story. Is the story ready? Is the story right? And in 2016, I think like many people, I found myself caught in a, in a storm, a storm about journalism, a storm that was about impartiality. At the time, as Rosie said, I was the director of BBC News 
a storm that followed quick on its heels about fake news. And for all the passion about those particular arguments, for all the strength of feeling about impartiality and fake news, I felt or feared that we were in the wrong argument. That the argument that we should be in was not about fake news, but about junk news. About news that was faster and faster, that was thinner and thinner, and that was increasingly samey. And it was not just a theoretical observation, it was the experience of my life. When I started out as a reporter, I started at the Financial Times, we produced, say, about 200 stories a day. By the time I left the Times, we were producing, between the newspaper and online, about 400 stories a day. By the time I left the BBC, when I asked someone, what do we think is our overall output, they said, the BBC, we produce about four seconds of news for every second of the day. And the thing that we worried about was that we, the BBC, like every other media organization, was being dwarfed by the likes of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and others. And so the response was to try to think of a different kind of newsroom. And as Rosie said, I left the BBC at the start of last year and set up a new news organization, one called Tortoise. Our mantra is yes, slow down, wise up. And our central thinking is this. Could we create a newsroom that is different in that it's slow, in that it's open, and that it's embracing the new? Slow means something actually very particular. I increasingly came, became concerned that news fetishizes speed. Our journalism, our news business, loves to be first. We love the breaking news. We love to be the fastest with the story. And yet we underestimate the incredible power of time. You heard earlier from Chris about just what it takes to deliver a story that takes time and the impact that that has. In my experience at the Times, Possibly one of the most valuable things that we ended up doing was following up on a tip from a reporter based up in Leeds who said that he had seen cases of child sex grooming in Rotherham and Rochdale. It's a reporter called Andrew Norfolk who among his many other qualities of thoughtfulness and emotional and, and political courage had an extraordinary tenacity. That tenacity meant that from the moment he first suggested that there was a story there to be reported to the very first story that we published in the Times, it took nearly 15 months. 15 months working on one story without your name, without an article appearing in the paper. And it's funny, the experience has profoundly changed the way in which I think you can do journalism, the way in which you can tackle a story, and it results in stories that you don't expect. Uh, in the light of some of Chris's reporting, in the light of the things that we've seen more broadly across the US, we commissioned a piece at Tortoise just over six months ago looking at the opioids crisis in the UK. And we thought we might come up with a story that was similar to the one of Purdue Pharma. We didn't. We ended up with a story that was entirely different a story about statistically much higher levels of prescription in the northeast of England, not related particularly to mental health, but related to social trauma and the practices of uh, commissioning groups and uh, medical uh, uh, doctors and experts there. My point is, taking your time can often lead you to an outcome, to a story that you didn't expect. But it wasn't just about being slower, because it's one thing to say, we're going to be slow in our journalism. It's another to say, we've got an idea for what we can do with that time. And the idea that we're hoping to develop at Tortoise is the idea of an open journalism. And open in quite a specific way. Uh, when I became editor of the Times, I went to go and have lunch with William Rees-Mogg. Some of you may remember William Rees-Mogg. He was the father of Jacob Rees-Mogg and the one who makes Jacob Rees-Mogg look like a Clark and Well hipster. <laughs> William loved to say that he wished he'd been born in the 18th century 
And if you'd met him, you thought he had been born in the 18th century. But we, we had this conversation about um, being editors of the paper. I was learning at his feet, and we had this childish conversation about what's your favorite page in the paper. And William's favorite page was the letters page. He loved the fact that the letters held the expertise, the enthusiasms, the eccentricities of the readers of the Times. And I loved the leaders page. The thing that I thought was the greatest privilege, I couldn't believe it, the thing I missed most when I moved to the BBC was leader conference. The idea that a group of people would troop into your office every day and argue out what you thought of the news. Not which stories to cover, but what you thought about it and what should happen next. And I often found coming to an opinion about the news was the best way to discover not just what I thought, but what I did and didn't know. It actually forced a deeper kind of reporting. And so what we're trying to develop at Tortoise, if you like, is to take that format, the format of a leader conference, and open it up. We call it a think-in, and it, the intention is to do what David Dimbleby uh, says, which is to understand that the wisdom, the star factor, is almost always in the audience. I'm sure that's true this evening. It's almost always in the audience. And we're trying to make sure that we listen and learn and create in our thinkings an organized system of listening. A system of listening that leads us to new ideas, that leads us to leads for stories that we otherwise would have missed. And the only way we think we can do that effectively is not just by doing that in our newsroom, which we do every night in London, but also out on the road, making sure that we're not just opening our doors, but moving our newsroom around the country and increasingly internationally to make sure we hear from a wider group of people. But why we're doing that is because we think that things are fundamentally changing. And so the reason I make the point about embracing the new is that you have to stand back and look at what's happening in our politics, in our economy, in our society, and come to the obvious realization that our media too closely matches our political parties and institutions. And those political parties and institutions are not really a match for the scale and the pace of change. So we, instead of creating a newsroom that establishes a political editor, an economics editor, a business editor, are focused on five big things. The five things that we think are not necessarily breaking news, but driving the news. They are new things, technology, innovation, science. They are the hundred year life. The fact that longevity means we need changes in health, in education, in housing, in the way in which we live. Belonging, identity, and our relationship with society. Our planet, the environment, and what we're going to do with the resources that are made available to us. And capital, the wealth and investment that can either accelerate progress or can also accelerate inequality. We take those five because one of the observations that we made starting out a new newsroom is that there's not an obvious or easy political bumper sticker. There's not a political party that we wanted to sign up to. In fact, like many people, we thought there wasn't an obvious or easy political manifesto. The more you look at it, the more you come to the realization that our politics and our media echoes the political arguments that were forged in the 19th century forged in those factories between capital and labor, and that those political arguments are being tested by the changes of technology, longevity, the environment, and the forces that I mentioned. And so instead, we've started, I hope, a journalism which is focused in a way that's sometimes heretical for newsrooms on something that is not just the story, but also the outcome, what happens next. That, I hope, makes us in Steve Jobs' great words, different. And perhaps different, too, is the spirit. One of the strange paradoxes of Steve Jobs' extraordinary creation, the computer, is that as well as connecting us, it has also reinforced the bonds we have with people we know and made it harder for us to understand and listen to people we don't. That in the jargon of sociologists, we're good at bonding, we're less good at bridging. We hope that we can start a journalism that is slow, open, and engages the new, and one above all, that does not just do bonding, but bridging to people to inform our points of view and to lead us to a different kind of story. Thank you very much.